going to talk about impacting people's lives. There is no other group of people more appropriate to talk about than truckers. You see, the trucking profession is the only profession that I know of that actually impacts every single individual on the face of this earth. No matter who you are, from the poorest of the poor to the richest of the rich, the clothes on your back, the food in your refrigerator, even the doors that hang from the hinges on your doorways, your, your furniture, uh, it, it, everything that you have was delivered to you by a trucker at some point. There is absolutely no business, there is absolutely no individual that wasn't impacted by a trucker. Now, it is possible you can go through life and not, and you may never need a doctor. As important as these people are, they certainly were important to me. But there are a lot of people who really never needed one. You may never really need a formal education, believe it or not. And there are plenty of people who have made it through their lives quite well without one. You may never need an attorney. And again, as important as lawyers and attorneys are, and a lot of, some people are laughing at that one, but uh, they, that is still an important profession. But you may never need one. And unbelievably, some of you may never need a mechanic, as important as that profession is. But everybody needs a trucker, because a trucker will impact everybody's life at some point. Talk about taking advantage of your daily second chance. Truckers certainly do that. Now, your life will impact others, so I'm going to challenge you to live your life in such a way that you will impact people just as much as a trucker does. Your second chance and how you use it will impact even more, or at least make a much more meaningful impact. There is something that's, um, that's been going on in society for a while, and it's a little on the optimistic side, and quite frankly, I, I was very glad to see it. It's, it's called paying it forward. And th this is just people who look around and they see a need and they, and they fill it. There have been recorded incidents where people would find a cra crowded uh, grocery store. They would actually jump in line at the cashier. Don't you hate it when people do that? <laughs> you're standing in line at Walmart, you're in a hurry to get home, and there's a crowd of people, and here comes some schmuck just jumping in line. But there have been some examples of people who would jump in line at a grocery store, and the whole purpose for doing so was to announce that they were going to pay for everybody's groceries, of everybody who's standing in line behind them. And of course, the people who are standing in line, all of a sudden, they're changing their attitude about this person at about this time. But it has happened. Now, it doesn't mean, if you're going to pay it forward, it doesn't mean you have to pay huge amounts of money. It doesn't mean they have to go knock on somebody's door and tell them you're going to pay their rent for a month. That would be nice. And, in fact, that has also happened. Uh, you could do something as simple as uh, volunteering for groups like uh, Meals on Wheels, for instance. Excellent group. Delivering meals to the elderly. Um, reading an important letter to somebody or an email to somebody who, for whatever reason, cannot uh, read it for themselves, for, for whatever reason. Well, and, th and that brings up another thing, volunteering to teach the illiterate to read. Look for opportunities to find ways to impact people's lives. Sometimes the opportunities don't present themselves so readily. You actually have to go out and look for them. But they are there, and they're, they are there by, by, by the tons, and they're easy to find. But you do have to look for them. Now, impacting other people's lives means giving of yourself. And the other side of that pay it forward attitude is the fact that we do, unfortunately, live in a self-centered world. Do you have a Facebook account? Do you ever post a selfie? Bet you have. <laughs> I've, I've done that uh, once or twice. Uh, I've, I've posted a couple of selfies in my time. Um, not a whole lot, but I have done. I have done that. But it's amazing to see people standing in the mall, taking a picture of themselves standing in front of something. And back in the day, you know, we used to have to have somebody else take our picture for us while we were standing there. And it was actually kind of an event to have your picture taken. And what's this with people taking pictures of their food, for goodness sake? Uh, have we become that self-centered where we actually think, ooh, I have this hamburger. I'm going to show it to everybody. Click, click. And then they post it on Facebook or Pinterest or on uh, Twitter or, or whatever. I remember back in the day when we used to say grace before eating. Now you just take a picture of it. When we were kids, we'd go over to Grandma's house. Grandma would bring out all these 
um, photo albums, and we could see this marvelous pictorial history of our of, of our lives. And when we were growing up, seeing our um, relatives we haven't seen in years, and relatives we'd never be able to see because they went on before us. It's a wonderful way to to learn your family history. Now you're just swiping through your phone. Oh, looky there. There's a there's a there's a steak that I had in night in 2012. Yeah, there's, oh, there's one of me in the bathroom. Um, that, that's so sad. But I but I digress. We we have to deny the self-centered. We have to deny the self-centered and look outward in order to impact other people's lives. And sometimes, fortunately, you can impact somebody's life in ways that you can't even dream. You can't, you can't dream that you're impacting somebody's life. I'll give you an example. Um, there was a, a period of my life when I was teaching music, and I would teach um, people of all ages to play instruments like uh, guitar, piano, organ. I taught uh, violin, viola, and cello, and bass, mainly strings and keys. And um, across the street from where I lived was a wonderful organization called Happy Hands Daycare Center. Now, I found out later, Happy Hands was a place that catered to hearing-impaired children or children of hearing-impaired adults. And they, they performed a wonderful service for this group of people. Um, they contacted me after seeing me on a local news story. And uh, after having discovered that I was just literally right across the street from them, they reached out to me with a challenge of, uh, do you think you could do something that would uh, help teach music to our deaf children? And I thought, you know, that's a wonderful, that's a wonderful, intriguing idea. So I gave it some thought, and I did come up with a couple of, a couple of ideas. I developed a method of teaching piano to deaf children. And this, at the time, this was strictly an experiment because I had no idea if this was going to work. And no, it didn't have anything to do with the children placing their hands on the instrument and feeling the vibrations. I don't even know if that's possible, uh, to be honest with you. But it had nothing to do with that. What in, Instead, what we did was we made sure that the children, this is one of the requirements of the uh, students that were, teach, that were learning piano, they had to be able to read words. So they had to be able to recognize letters. We taught them the uh, keys of the piano and what their names were. Now, in the musical alphabet, you only have uh, seven letters. You have A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, it's seven, okay. Um, and that's it. And then the alphabet, the musical alphabet just begins to repeat itself. So all up and down the keyboard or on any in the fretboard of a guitar or fingerboard on a cello or a violin, it's all the same thing. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and so on and so forth, up the musical scale or down, depending on the direction you're going. So we taught the children exactly where the keys were, where, where to find the key that was C, where to find the key that was D. Then I took, I made flashcards with just letters on them, A through G. Each card had a different letter, and they had to find that letter on the keyboard. Okay. Now, once they were comfortable with this, then I started putting up flash flashcards with words on them, and they were words I formed with just the letters A through G. And, uh, actually, with a little bit of imagination, you can find quite a few uh, words like bag, uh, bag, bed, egg, dad, um, gab. Uh, we, we, the largest words I found were baggage and cabbage. Those were the largest that I was able to find. But they would just simply look at the keyboard on the piano and they would find those letters and push them down. So they were actually approaching the keyboard on a piano in the same way that you would approach the keyboard on a computer or a typewriter. They were actually finding the letters on there. Once they became comfortable with spelling the words, then we put gibberish in front of them, just absolute gibberish. And there was certain spacings between the letters. And the longer the space, the longer they would hold the key down on the keyboard. The end result, if they followed the directions, the end result was a recognizable tune. Now, for the children, this experience was purely, um, uh, what, what was that uh, scientist's name? Pavlov. Uh, their experience was purely Pavlovian in nature because they were noticing a response that people were giving them. If they followed the instructions and played the tune, even though they couldn't hear it, if they followed the instructions and played exactly what was in front of them, that evoked a certain response from the people around them. 
The people around them, of course, were thoroughly entertained because they were hearing a recognizable song being played by a children who did not have the ability to hear. Now, I understood how important that was. I, I was able to get that, and I thought, I patted myself on the back, and I thought, man, this is pretty cool. But, you know, I really didn't understand what was going on. Uh, even though intellectual on an intellectual level I, I was able to, to grab a hold of this, I really wasn't grabbing on to what was going on. Then Happy Hands said, hey, we're going to have this uh, event come up, and we're going to have the parents um, at, at, this, uh, at this event. We want you to put together a little musical uh, program to, to, for the children to perform for the parents. I thought, okay, we can do that. So we expanded the idea of the piano students because that was strictly for children ages six and up. I think it's, I think it's what it was. But we we did we found something else to do with children that were five and younger, and uh, we formed a handbell choir. Now with them, they were really easy to teach because they each had one handbell in each hand, and I just stood in front of them and pointed at each student one at a time, sometimes two at a time. And the rule was, if I pointed at you, you rang your bell. And when I pulled back like this, you quit ringing your bell. It was pretty simple. But still, it was kind of cute to see the kids up there winging the bells and actually playing out these Christmas carols for their uh, 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 for their parents, because this was a Christmas event. Then came time for the children playing piano. They each took their turns. Each one of them did just a marvelous job. I was so proud. Um, and I still thought it was pretty cool, but I really still didn't understand what was going on. Then after the event was over, the parents came up and uh, some of them had tears running down their face. I said, man, I never thought I would ever hear my children, my children playing music. That's the one thing we didn't even think was possible. As you could tell, I, I, I can't share that story now without choking up a little bit. Because then it started to dawn on me just how important this was. Here, these, these parents gave, had children that, for whatever reason, w was not gifted with, with the gift of sound. They wouldn't be able to hear anything their entire life. And yet, here they were playing music, and they were able to share this emotional bond, bond in such a way with the parents that they've never experienced before. It was a wonderful experience. And of course, the children benefited in other ways, too, because music does have mathematical properties, and so there's, there's purely a, uh, there really is a bona fide sound educational experience. But you see, up until that point, on an intellectual level, I knew what was going on. But on an emotional level, I did not understand the importance of that impact that it had on those children and the impact it had on their parents' lives as well. Now, if there's somebody watching this video that wants to take that idea and run with it, you certainly have my blessings. We, uh, surprisingly, we tried to find grant money to continue that program. Um, and it just absolutely astounded me when we, we discovered that nobody was really interested in funding that. Um, but that's all, that's all the uh, curriculum was, just as I explained it. So if you want to take that and run with it, you got my blessing. Just let me know you did it and let me know what kind of experience you have. But that's just another way how you can impact somebody's life without ever intending, without ever meaning to. Now imagine the impact you're going to have with your life when you start recognizing your second chances and taking advantage of those and reaching out and denying yourself and reaching out to others to impact their lives. Imagine what you can do to change the world. Next week, we're going to talk about trimming the way the fat and getting rid of time wasters, the things that keep us from doing that. Until then, go out today and impact somebody's life.